So thanks, Tom. Thanks for the intro, and uh, thanks for the tech, all of you at, here at Tech Field Day for having me again. So here I, today, I wanted to share uh, what we've been doing, the latest that we've been doing in uh, IoT, and how it enables a lot of different use cases, from manufacturing to mining to utilities to oil and gas, and so on and so forth, and even crime fighting. I wanted to introduce a little uh, little angle from that perspective as well. So I wanted to talk about how we can how we're making cities safer what it would take if you wanted to wire up a cave and then also how we can protect lives with our latest ap and how we're actually doing that in some places it's no it's no argument that we see iot transforming virtually every industry whether it's heavy industry, manufacturing, mining, like I said, or oil and refineries, or even farming and agriculture. They got sensors out in the fields, they got livestock wearing collars. There's all sorts of use cases for gathering data and then making better decisions based on all that data. We've been working with over 65,000 customers now. And I think that's really exciting. The last time I shared this slide was in Cisco Live Barcelona in January. So not even a full six months later, and the number there was only 50,000. So it gives you an idea of the growth and the rate of it that we're seeing a lot more adoption of these technologies because the value and propositions are very, very high and self-evident. One customer in particular uh, we've been working with uh, of late that uh, I can't reveal the name. You know how it is sometimes when you're just like bound by legal reasons or secret identity reasons or other things like that, and you can't like share somebody's <laughs> name. But let's just call him Mr. Wayne. He came to us and he had a very unique set of use cases and requirements, and it was only our latest technologies that could meet everything that he was looking to do. So I'm really excited to share that, and uh, we'll see how our gear can help even some very extreme use cases like he presented to us. Start by making cities safer. So Mr. Wayne lives in a city that's notorious for crime. He's actually been crime fighting this year for 80 years, can you believe it? And the crime keeps getting worse year after year after year and he's like, Cisco, what can you do to help me uh, in my battles here? I'm, I'm getting a little bit on in years. And so we've been sharing some advancements in our Cisco ISR uh, routers. So I have them, I have all our gear that we're going to be talking about here with me today. Will it help if I just put it down here for a second? Does that help to zoom in on? And so our ISR 1101 router, and we just released now an extension module on top of that. So what's different or what's new or what's relevant about um, these, these devices? Well, one of the main things is that we have um, hot swappable, flexible module so that if you're running, say, 3G today or maybe 4G, and then you want to be running 5G in the near future, you just pop in a new module, the SIM card is on the side, and you're ready to go. With the expansion module, you can even pop that in on the top and you can have active, active uplinks. This is the first ruggedized router also running iOS XE, so it gives us all the same programmable interfaces and all the same feature functionality like your ISRs that are in the data center. So a tremendous amount of flexibility there. It's also a very low power unit. This whole thing draws less than 10 watts, including the expansion module. So you, you have all that benefit because sometimes you're running these things based on like solar power panels or where power is at a premium in a very remote location. What's also interesting with the new uh, extension module is that in, in addition to dual um, adaptable ports, we have dual uplinks, but also four generic input-output mechanisms. So you could connect them directly to any sensors that you're interested in. Like say you're in an airport environment, you might be connecting and collecting information on the temperature, the winds, the humidity, the light, etc. Mr. Wayne, for instance, he has a bunch of these all around the city and he has sensors for like, you know, nerve gas and uh, airborne hallucinogenics or, you know, Geiger counters because sometimes they transport nuclear weapons through a city and so on and so forth. He's ready for anything because they're general purpose, they're completely flexible. But when you say general purpose, do you mean are they TTL, are they analog, are they 
Just digital I.O. or? Digital I.O. So they can connect to any other digital I.O. sensor. Once you get the signal, you've captured it. And then the other thing, too, the extension module gives you is a removable SD WAN card. So for up to 100 gig of local data can be stored. And then you could even do processing on the edge device. You don't have to send everything up over the network, which is very latency, uh, costs you bandwidth, as well as then um, you can make decisions closer to the source in case you have a real-time requirement in that, uh, in that scenario as well. Not only that, but we've seen that this is very effective in use cases. Oh, one more thing I wanted to touch on and I mentioned it. What's really nice too is that why Mr. Wayne likes it because the company he works for slash owns happens to be an SD-WAN shop. So he doesn't have to like use a different pane of glass to manage now these new devices that he's got out in the field. He can use that same uh, SD-WAN uh, view and then add, just add this on to his existing network complete with all the policies and intent-based networking that he already has in place there. How effective is this? I think this is just a tremendous case study, and the city of New Orleans is actually here with us on the World of Solutions floor. In 2016, they were really uh, felt that the crime was getting out of control, and they, they took on a new initiative to leverage technologies to address this. And so they deployed over 400 of these video surveillance cameras and 500 of IR devices, not this one, because this one wasn't around yet, but IR routers throughout the city, and then had a real-time crime center. And this real-time crime center had image recognition and pattern recognition, and so they were able to uh, very efficiently see crimes in action. And they could do things like, if they saw a robbery in action, they could transmit that video feed to a local policeman that was in the area, and then he could see it, and he'd be just walking up right behind the criminal and put him in cuffs as he's walking on the street moments after he stole somebody's purse, for example. Or in other types of cases where there's a traffic accident. It usually takes about 20 minutes of interviewing once the officer gets on site to collect all the facts and to make reports and so on and so forth. But with all the different camera angles available to them, they can really speed up their time. What was the net effect on crime? This is almost astounding. The murder rate for the city went back nearly 50 years in time. From uh, all the way from 2018 all the way down to 1971 levels and a year-by-year -year drop in non-fatal shootings at 28 percent. So it's just a phenomenal um, advantage in their use case, which they're looking to do, to lower the crime rates, uh, applying the technologies, putting that out in the field, combining with uh, the video surveillance image recognition and all the networking systems, and a very real tangible effect on the entire community. They're actually, like I mentioned, they're here. They got a little very interesting booth near the back of the World of Solutions towards the left side, and they have live video feeds uh, of you know, their cameras being spanned over here. And interesting statistics, and this is from yesterday. As of yesterday, which is you know, relatively early in the week, they already saved 993 man hours of police time by um, assisting and augmenting all of these uh, processes via the video feed. That's, that's half a year's worth of time in a week that they saved, even half a week, I would say. So very, very effective uh, application of technology for that use case. So our, our client, Mr. Wayne, was very impressed. And he goes, you know what? I got another challenge for you. <laughs> He's like, I got a cave, OK? And I have, um, it's not a normal environment. It's not a nice, cushy, temperature-controlled environment. There's a lot of humidity, a lot of water. Um, from time to time, I discharge explosives and stuff like that. And so I need to have like a network that's 100% available in conditions like this. He's like, you know, what can you do for me? And so we said, okay, sure, we'll, we'll rise to that challenge and uh, we'll, we'll give you a catalyst switch that can meet this heavy duty environment. So this is the IE3400H, H for heavy duty. In um, January in Barcelona, we released the IR3400 ruggedized. So basically this is a catalyst switch. It's running iOS XC, that's the key thing to keep in mind. Just like your catalyst switches in your data centers, but it's specifically engineered for ruggedized environments. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. If you want, I'd be happy to pass some of these things around if you guys want to have a look and feel. Cool. 
And so it doesn't really look like a switch, you know, because we don't see any RJ45 ports. You have these ports that are called M12 connectors. And so there are 12 millimeter threads, circular connectors, and that's where your RJ cables uh, will plug into to the various devices. And it's IP67 uh, rated. That's a rating for dust and water resistance. And so we have uh, this switch even available down on the showroom floor. And on a demo, and you can see it, it doesn't need a separate enclosure. It can go into the harshest environments. And basically what we're doing is we're taking our catalyst technology, completely re-engineering it head to toe from component level to enclosure to everything in between to heavy and duty environments. And then we also add support for things that we see in the industrial use cases that we're buying these for, such as support for these industrial protocols, as well as additional features. Sometimes there's timing requirements that are incredibly precise. I spent a long time working in QoS, and there the timing of real-time applications, uh, the boundaries were like uh, 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds end-to-end. -end. Well, we have applications where the the window is 10 milliseconds, and in some cases, one millisecond. So you really need things like precision time protocol, time-sensitive networking, and a lot of availability and redundancy uh, support. Can you do PoE with it? Yes, absolutely. You can do PoE with these switches as well. So it just depends on the models that you're supporting. They, some models and uh, extension modules support PoE, and some are in non. So it just depends which one you want to buy. Now. When we presented this in um, Barcelona, then Ivan uh, had some really interesting questions. He's like, what goes into hardware uh, your engineering to get it to be ruggedized and to be heavy duty? And so at that time, I was like, oh, I didn't, you know, other than component selection, I didn't really have a good answer for him. So I did been doing some extra homework and research and working with the hardware engineers. And so I want to share some of that. So first of all, when it comes to temperature ranges, some of the things we do, is that there are no moving parts in these devices whatsoever. So there's no fans. But as you'll notice from the shape of them, the entire enclosure is also designed to be a heat sink. That's why you see those grooves down the sides. And that all helps to radiate heat. You'll notice that they're all metal, so they're quite heavy. And this is also key too, because a lot of competitive products in these spaces are made of plastic. And plastic is very, uh, it's brittle, it's, it cracks under stress, and even under sunlight or even chemical exposure can fracture and have issues. So this is as heavy duty you know, as it gets. Not only that, but even at the component level, the, the individual components are all industrial grade. They're different grade. There's commercial for anything that goes into a data center. Then you have industrial, you have automotive, and then you have even military grades, which include military space. So we will always use industrial or higher components when designing these uh, hardware devices. There's something even interesting about the details of the colors. If you'll notice that the switches that are designed to be in indoor places are black, as are the uh, routers there. But the devices that would be even potentially outside are white. And the texture is different. If you feel some of them, um, you'll notice that the white is very smooth, and uh, these ones have a little bit of a texture to them. And that, again, has to do with heat displacement. Black is the most effective color to radiate heat, and so that's as efficient as it gets. But if you, paint, if you painted something black that's meant to be outdoors, then it also, unfortunately, absorbs heat, which can then you know, compound the effect that you're seeking to nullify or to counter. And so that's why you see them uh, different colors, different textures. All of these even little nuances go in to the hardware design to achieve the needed effect here. In addition to this, shock and vibration. It's like if you put, if you notice them, um, that we have on the shuttle buses, we have our, our IR routers. Like if you take a shuttle or if you have your app, does somebody have the Cisco Events app? If you go into the Cisco Events app, one of the options on the side is the uh, shuttle tracker. And you enter, you, you enter where you are and where you want to go, and it'll show you a map of you know, where all the buses are and how long you have to wait to that shuttle to arrive. 
Why? Because we have an IR router, a mobile one, on these buses themselves, and that's transmitting its information where it is and combined with map data and location data, and that's all then contributing to a user experience. So you're not just waiting and wondering, but you have a better user experience, kind of like a more Uberish one. You're like, okay, I know when to expect my ride. It's gonna be here momentarily. I can watch it come towards me on the screen until I can pick it up visually. And so in order to engineer that, you need to have very high shock and vibe standards. Well, how do you engineer your hardware to meet that? Well, basically, the principle is fewer connections that need to be made. Avoid connectors at all costs. So integrate as much as possible inside. Put all of the circuits together as you can into single circuits rather than having multiple parts and connectors. If, if and where connectors are needed, use the highest quality connectors. For example, some competitors use what's called an SMA connector for coaxial. And these type of connectors are very prone to being uh, uh, loosened. They're very cheap but they'll come loose under uh, heavy vibration over time, or they can be over torqued. When we have these connectors on our mobile devices, we use a connector call type called TNC. It's much more, it's a little more expensive, but it's much more reliable. You can't over torque it. It's a much better overall connector. Then another thing we have to engineer for are things like lightning strikes and power surges. Lightning strikes are self-evident. You put that on a telephone pole somewhere, sooner or later it could get hit by lightning. But even power surges, maybe it's in places you might not expect them. When you put a device on a railway car, there could be a difference in electronic voltage potential in the hundreds of volts from one car to another because it has to do with the instantaneous effectiveness of the grounding systems. And as it travels, it's not always perfectly even. So from one car to another, you have this massive difference in potential and static electricity. That could just blow your electronics to bits. So you'll notice that all our enclosures are metal and that actually contributes to the grounding. We also have grounding components built right in. There is no electrical component that is isolated from ground. So it's not like it, if, if something gets surged, it has to like rush through a set of electrical components before it hits the ground. No, it's all connected, every single part. And so that protects in those type of environments. Not only that, but every single connector on these type of circuits has built-in circuitry in the input to make sure, hey, is this a legitimate change in voltage that's because of a signal change, or is it a power surge? Because don't forget, in a data center environment, this isn't something you have to worry about. You have all the surge protection built into the electrical systems that's powering that data center. You don't get that out in the field, out where these IoT devices reside. Not only that, we engineer for radiation immunity, both the uh, coming from out from outside the box or also being generated inside. In the case of wireless or cellular, you wanna make sure that none of those signals interfere with the internal operations. So they are electrically shielded and they have the cleanest RF uh, signals. Uh, we always use the highest, cleanest technology for that. We do a lot of cool testing. And so this is the kind of stuff we thought you might get a kick out of seeing what these guys go through. And so this is the same unit Internally, we call this box tracks, but it's the IE3400, and it's got to meet that IP67 resistance for dust and also for uh, liquid. We actually have it downstairs on the World of Solutions where it's being splashed ever since the beginning of the week, and Sunday, I think we got powered this up, or Monday morning, and it's being soaked uh, the whole time that we've been going. I was hoping to do the same for you guys today here too. I bought one of these units. Uh, everything was working except for this power cable. It looks like that got damaged as I brought it over from the hotel room last night. And I was told by Brianna that uh, not to bring water to douse it. So the first thing I did when I arrived at the airport, I drove over to Walmart and bought 12 liters, three gallons of blue Gatorade, because that's what she recommended. And I was hoping to splash this all down for you while we were transmitting traffic for you uh, and have it all going. But maybe next time, maybe we'll retry that next time. But basically, you see the same type of effect on the world of solutions if you want to see that in action. We also pop these things into ovens. We crank the heat. This one's up to 184 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, you know, we just we we 
we just leave them in there for hours at a time to make sure that they are durable. He even has, a, he even has an apron. Yeah. Sometimes we make cookies. cookies. Sometimes we don't. It all depends how hungry we are. Uh, we also throw them into nitrogen-cooled uh, freezers all the way down to minus 40 Celsius or minus 40 Fahrenheit. And the same overall deal. And we we'll leave them in for hours, if not days, depending on the, the industry specification that we're looking to verify the particular hardware unit at. Now, one of the most uh, satisfying, uh, one of the most satisfying <laughs> tests that we run, uh, everybody wants to sign up for because it's it's also very stress relieving, is the drops. And so to be able to drop things from you know multiple stories, it just <laughs> releases a lot of stress, and then we we get carried away because we just want to keep on going with every electronic device that's ever frustrated us. We even dunk things. So uh, when you have to have um, complete water proofing, which is different from water resistance, uh, then we'll keep them under water. Some of these specifications say that have to be able to survive under water for up to eight hours. And so you'll do that kind of testing. But we'll do, like if the specification says eight, we'll typically do many multiple factors of that beyond to really uh, make sure that it's not just meeting the specification, but quite a bit beyond. <coughs> The other benefit, too, that um, Mr. Wayne likes is that these switches, because he's not only an SD-WAN shop at work, but he's also a DNA shop. So uh, he gets to manage these from his DNA center. He can do all the same policies, like software-defined access. And I really think, and I feel very strongly, that the, the greatest case, use case for software-defined access is in IoT. For instance, at the keynote, we saw demonstrations of multi-domain policy, and there the example was, oh, if users are trying to access an application like a payroll application and things like that. But you can manage that policy at various levels, in the, including within the application itself, by giving users login rights and passwords and privileges within the apps. They can be complemented, certainly, and, and, and uh, enhanced by network policies, but in an IoT environment, the network policy is key. Why? Because when an IoT device is compromised, which very often happens, we had several of those use cases outlined the last time we had a session, the very first things it does is it starts to do scanning and reconnaissance. It tries to talk to everything else it can to increase its foothold uh, into the enterprise and to increase that breach. So that's where the real value of segmentation comes in. And we see even an example of this in a very unique attack angle just three months ago in March. There was a company called Norsk Hydro, which is the world's largest manufacturer of aluminum. And they were attacked, and we're very used to network attacks that are infosec related. There's a, you know, you're trying to breach the data or hold the data for ransomware or exfiltrate data, whatever it may be. But this one was specifically targeted to operations. They wanted to stop these companies' operations. And they attacked their, their uh, aluminum production lines and held these for ransom. And when these are down, it's millions of dollars a minute. This attack cost Norsk Hydro $52 million and raised the worldwide price of aluminum because they had to revert to manual operations uh, to avoid uh, the, the ransomware um, attacks that they were going through. So uh, the third area that I wanted to talk about, we've talked about route. We've also talked about switching. Let's talk about what we're doing in wireless. So our client came back to us, and he's like, OK, now that I have a rocking network in my cave, he goes, of course I want Wi-Fi. I want to be able to roam. I have semi-autonomous vehicles that have to you know, be guided and do their own things. And you know, I want to be able to run Netflix from wherever I happen to be and a very high quality. So we're like, OK, absolutely. We've got the gear for you. And if you look really closely, you'll see these up in the walls, and you'll, you'll see our Cisco logo. But basically, we've uh, announced this new um, heavy-duty and access switch that's designed specifically for hazardous locations. It meets an industry standard that's uh, called Class 1 Division 2. So this is what you have to meet when you're um, in an oil refinery environment or something like that, where there's explosives in the air and all of these other conditions. You really have to uh, get to this highest level of safety in the engineering of the product. And this is actually the first 
access point that meets these specifications. And so this can go into all of these types of environments and some of the key features that it has, in addition to 802.11ac wave two antennas across the top, we have this port here for IoT module. So for example, this is something that Liz and Tony featured in the keynote on Monday is that different manufacturers can piggyback onto this access point and use it for backhaul and complement the, the Wi-Fi system with whatever systems there happen to be running. In this case, what I'm showing is Emerson Hart, which is a system that monitors different sensors in RFID. It sets up its own resilient mesh that complements any Wi-Fi mesh that you might set up. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. So not only do we support, for instance, Pardon me, um, Emerson, but also ISA 100, which is uh, a standard that Honeywell uses. And we're looking to do other things here. For instance, some of the discussions have to do with like Bluetooth, low energy, um, or Zigbee, or other types of protocols, or GPS, or whatever the case may be. And so here's how we actually have it running in a refinery. Uh, this is Suncor. And as such, we offer a wireless network an AC wireless network for all the workers, completely you know, resilient throughout their entire operations because a lot of them walk around with like heavy ruggedized iPads, they call them tough pads, and then they take information and they enter it in or they communicate or they're doing whatever they're doing on these digital tablets. But then also there's a lower area network, that wireless heart. And so wireless heart is also a mesh network and it tracks the RFIDs and a tag that's in the clothing on every, any given worker. So when the worker enters the site, they wear their hard hat, that wear their high-vis vests, and within that there's an RFID tag that they're constantly tracked so you know where your workers are. And so this is, has, has a huge impact on safety. The, when they're tracking this, they're saying we've reduced our safety incidents by half. And then some of the um, numbers they showed to that in an average size plant, this is saving them $15 million in operations. So just having wireless technology in a form factor that actually works in these hazardous environments that is flexible enough to allow for industry specific applications to work together in conjunction and complement each other, very tangible and significant savings as well as the, the safety factor. That's the number one priority in any OT environment is the worker safety. So if you can cut those incidents down by half, that's a phenomenal achievement. So before this AP, was it just that these environments couldn't have wireless or was it like, did they have to go into enclosures or? That's it, enclosures. Yeah. So uh, I think I had a slide on that. Let me just um, back up and see if I can find that because that was a, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Here's a slide that Patty actually shared. She goes, you really want to have a slide of what people would do before they had this type of uh, systems available to them. They'd buy these special uh, rated enclosures and then they'd try and like ad hoc jam multiple types of devices into them because they're not integrated. So you'd have the wireless heart, you'd have a AP from one vendor, a thing from another. You'd try and make it you know, all patchwork together uh, and then this would be very expensive and it would run a lot of um, heat, obviously, and then it wouldn't play nicely together because that's not really how they're engineered to, to work. So it's far more effective to have a form factor that's actually purpose-built for that environment and yet has the flexibility to be adapted to the unique requirements of company A versus company B. Uh, et cetera and so on. And remind all, me, remind all, me your name. Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. Jordan, you know what? That was a great question. And because I like great questions, yes. I want to express my this. appreciation. Thank you. By giving you a signed book of, uh, that's our latest book, uh, Digital Network Architecture. So Dave Zacks, he probably was in yep. here um, either yesterday or the day before, and Matt Faulkner and Simone and Arena. So I so appreciate the good questions. So. Any other questions? I don't have more books, but I'm happy to take more <laughs> All questions. All of a sudden, everybody's in. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the whole purpose of this, right, is, is spark proof, yep. heat proof. I mean, there, there's all kinds of, like, you know, strict regulations. That's it. I have some industrial clients that have there you go. this type of environment. So I'm like, 
I'm somewhat familiar with with some of the things that they have to jump through. So it's yeah. interesting to see these things being developed because it's not the first time I've seen industrial switch. Or yeah, yeah, like of course. But the AP is really interesting because I know they've had to jump through a lot of hoops there. Yeah. But is there any, I mean, I still think there's probably going to be some hesitancy or limitations on the client side too because those matter as well, the environments you bring in or the things you bring in. So, I mean, I think this is like a whole ecosystem that's changing to try to bring technology into these oh, definitely. environments. Definitely. And so, you know, the, the place that we're playing is not so much in the endpoints, yeah, but our, our main goal is the, um, the secure um, processing, analyzing, transportation of that data from the edge to it's the application. You have yeah. to have the infrastructure before you can get the clients yeah. anyway. So, but it's interesting that all these are integrated into the into the existing tools. SD yeah, did I, did I mention this is also yeah supports uh, by DNA Center. Yeah. So again, it was on the bottom single, of the slide. It was yeah, it was really good. Single pane of glass, and so all the benefits of assurance, you know, and we have assurance, you know, running here. Um, at at the show right now, for instance, you probably you guys had uh, probably some sessions on assurance right now, and you could even if you logged in, you could see <laughs> how many clients are connected and what their onboarding times and roaming times, etc., are, and you have now all that visibility even now in <coughs> your oil and gas refinery environment. Okay, I'm having an issue joining that network. But anyways, <laughs> but well, hopefully assurance will tell us why. Exactly. So we'll find that out. But for instance, the last time I checked, which was about 90 minutes ago, there were 16,000 clients. 91% were onboarding within two seconds, and on, uh, roaming times were less than three seconds. Having that big picture view really allows you to know. Okay, if somebody's complaining, it's a network. You can either see for a fact it is a network, and then troubleshoot. Uh, or even going back in time to troubleshoot, or you can say, no, I have the numbers here that show it's not the network, there's something else. Maybe it's a client driver issue or whatever else um, goes into that equation. So to recap, here's what I want to leave you with. So we see IoT transforming virtually every industry, and we're here to make that secure transfer of data from the edge to the app, so regardless of any environment, whether it's ruggedized environments, we talked about the routers and the use cases in the cities or in mobile environments, whether it's uh, industrialized switches and manufacturing and mining or uh, oil and gas again or any other use case. And then we have now specifically design industry uh, leading wireless access points for these hazardous uh, environments. What does this allow and what does this provide for our customers? Well, it keeps them safer. That's the number one priority of OT environments, operational technology environments, so like human safety, absolutely. We can then increase also efficiency because if we're able to do, like we know where all the people are at a given point in time rather than sending somebody out. Or for instance, we use the example of how the police are now more efficient in the city of New Orleans because they're augmented with the technology uh, at their fingertips. They can give you more data-driven insights rather than um, you know, wondering what's going on, having that big picture view, both of your network, but also of your operations. If you, everything is sensor enabled and brings it all in, you can, analyze and learn and process all that information, do predictive failures uh, and things like that. Then finally, it makes your life easier. It simplifies your operations and that's what our client loves the most. He's like, look, I'm fighting crime. It's a lot easier than it used to be. I've been doing this for 80 years and now it's like getting a little bit hard on my body. I'm leveraging technology to do so and I'm doing it more effectively than ever. So that's what I want to share with you guys today. And so thanks again for having me here at Tech Field Day. It's always a privilege and honor.